Pastor Dan next door. Amen. Amen. We're glad to have all of our visitors today. Are there any visitors here again in the churches? Lift up your hand today. Amen. Give God some praise for our visitors and our young people. Next Sunday is, is Church Reunion Sunday. Say Church Reunion Sunday. I want you to go find somebody who has not been at Mount Zion for years or who have moved on to other church and tell them that pastor wants you to come back home on next Sunday and be with us for Back to Church Sunday, also Church Reunion Sunday at both services. Uh, we're going to have Pastor McNichols going to be preaching at 9 o'clock, and then I'll be preaching at 11. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. Pastor Martha McNichols will be here in the house for the earlier services on next week. And I want all of you who have not voted, as Pastor Larry said, we need you to be in the voting booth on November. We need you to register. Yeah, give God some praise. That's right. You need to be in there. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Are you on lockdown? On say, neighbor. neighbor. Are you really on lockdown? <laughs> say, neighbor. neighbor. Are you on lockdown? For Jesus. Say, neighbor, are you a prisoner for the Lord? Say, neighbor, if you are a prisoner for the Lord, there's just some things you won't do. Say, neighbor, if you're tied up for the Lord, there's some things you won't do. Give God some praise there. And can I ask you a question? May I ask you a question this morning? Have you ever had someone to mistreat you? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it happens to me all the time. And, and, and if someone has ever mistreated you, did not they get on your last nerve? Say, neighbor, it happened to me last week. You know, so often when people mistreat you and get on your last nerves, it makes you want to reach out and grab them in the name of the Lord. I've got to be honest. There are some people who can really get on your last nerve, and still there are other folks who will take your kindness for weakness. That happened to me some years ago. Some years ago, I should never forget, I was good and kind to this one person in my life. I thought that me and this person had become friends. But he made me so mad and impacted some other folk that I decided maybe I better take an early sabbatical from the church. <laughs> or else I would have found myself killing somebody and you would have been pastorless. Can you believe it? The sin of someone in the church drove me away from the church until I thought about my own sins and my own sins brought me back to the church. Anyway, this dude, this friend of mine, this, this, this dude, this friend of mine uh, was so close to me that I would have given him my last $20. Have you ever had a person in your life like that? Well, I would have even split a Burger King Whopper with cheese with this one person in my life. But all of a sudden, this jokester started take, talking crazy to me. And to make matters worse, this rascal caused, caused me even more problems when he started lying on me. Do you know anybody who knows how to lie on you? And not only was he lying on me, but the truth of the matter is he was talking behind my back. Has that ever happened to you? And when he was talking behind my back, I kept thinking about that song, Backstabbers. Sometimes they do tell lies. Anyway, when that happened to me, I understood that it became a real test of my belief in Christianity and the love of Jesus Christ. And I had to learn the art of forgiveness and forbearing the sins of others, as Paul says. And so I had taken about all I wanted to take. I planned some tremendous retaliatory measures for him. 
it was going to be what you call a ghetto fabulous coke bottle attack upside his head. I was going to do a Batman and Robin on him. A jab, a zam, a wham, and a bam. Right upside his head, coupled with a whole lot of jabs to his face. I even thought about going out there and getting a metal pipe across the lower leg and directly hit him right above the chin and just below the knee. I had it all planned out. I planned what you call an old-fashioned behind whipping. And one to which I heard about the ever-ready battery. It was just going to keep on going and going and going and going. I admit I had planned that old-fashioned beatdown that was going to be such a blessing to me and such a stress reliever for me. After all, I saw this jokester, this friend of mine who I used to call a friend, now I call him a friend of me. He was a friend who is now an enemy. And I felt that it was this friend who is now an enemy was the point of my pain, my stress, my problems, my headaches, my issues. That was my initial thoughts. I figured it was time for me just going to attack my pain straight on. But as God had it, you know, God always have a way of detouring you and turning you around. Thank God for these things called devotional books. I had my little devotional book, and back then, Joel Osteen had just come out, and so I read one of Joel Osteen's devotional, and in the devotional, he said these words that really pricked my heart. He said, the sooner you learn to bless your enemies, to be good to people, and have that have not been good to you, the better you're going to be. He was challenging me to change my mind and to switch. And instead of me returning evil for evil, he wanted me to return good for evil. And then I read on into the devotional. I never shall forget. It said these words. Don't get it twisted. You are meek, not weak. I closed that book and I walked off. But the Lord forced me to open the book up again and reread it again. The lesson that God wanted me to learn was never render evil for evil, but good for evil. And then I began remembering what Christianity is all about. That Christianity is not about arrogance. Christianity is not becoming high. Christianity is not about exalting yourself. Christianity is not about getting back at folk. Christianity is not about cursing folk out when they deserve to be cursed out. Have I got a witness? Christianity is not about taking somebody uh, and giving them a ghetto, fabulous Coca-Cola bottle attack with a total number of jabs, zam, bam, upside their head, even though they deserve it. Christianity is not about getting a metal pipe across the lower leg and directly hitting the person upside the chin. And when they rise up again, you knock them back down. That's not what Christianity is all about. The Bible says Christianity is about learning how to be humble and meek in the sight of God. Christianity, never forget, is about meekness. Say meekness. And so many of us think meekness is about weaknesses and becoming weak. But no, meekness is not about weakness. It's about power under control. It's about being controlled by the power that you are up under. And I heard somewhere the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through not ourselves, through not rebellion, through not retaliation. But we are more than conquerors through Christ. Who the Bible says will always strengthen you in times of weaknesses. Won't God pick you up when you're down? Won't God straighten you out when you're in a crooked pathway? Won't God lift you up when your head is bowed down? Won't God make a way out of no way? Won't God lead you into all truth and righteousness? Won't God make your enemies your footstool? Have I got a witness in the house? If you just wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he has a way of strengthening your life. Have I got two witnesses in the house? 
I read that devotional book. I read the words of Jesus. I remember what God told me about Christianity. And I heard what God was saying to me that day. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that I didn't kill somebody. I then prayed and asked the Lord to help me. And guess what happened? When I asked him to help me, when I thanked him for the devotional, when I thought about how he had changed my mind at certain kinds of things about this so-called friend of mine, I ran right smack in the person while visiting the Sam Clubs. You see, what God would do is when you pray for him and when you make a decision to do a certain kind of a thing, he would challenge you with an experience. You say you can handle it now? He puts the man in front of me. My first initial thought, though, was to take him down right then. I want to get him. Make it quick. But I did not. And the reason why I did not was because when you are a Christian, when you have been saved, when you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, when you say you are an ambassador or representative of Jesus Christ, when you say you're more than a conqueror, when you say for God I live and for God I die, then you have the power to handle anything that is put in front of you, the ability, the wherewithal, the skills, the experience, and the technique to know how to turn that person over to Jesus and let the Lord work it out. Won't he work it out? Won't he make your enemies your footstool? Won't he make a way out of no way? Won't he lift up your bow down head? Won't he regulate your mind? Won't he turn you around? I wish I had a witness in the house. God worked it out. And when you are a real Christian, Paul says, you are on lockdown. Lockdown is when you're in a place where you cannot leave. Lockdown is a place of prison concept where you can't move to certain kinds of locations and do what you want to do because you are inc inc incarcerated. You are in prison. And so there are some things that you just can't do when you are in lockdown. Have I got a witness? Paul says something very powerful here. It's found in the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the first through the three verses. And what Paul says, first of all, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus. Now, that's very unusual for him to say that because he normally says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. And on this wise, in that verse, you can put it up there, in that verse, he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word prisoner means that I am in lockdown. Say lockdown. Say I'm, I'm in lockdown. That's what the word prisoner means. It means literally that I am, I am to live in lockdown. Say I'm to live in lockdown. And, and so he says, here, 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 is, here, is my, here is where I'm at. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation. I am a prisoner of the Lord, which means I am in lockdown. And since I am in lockdown, I have to surrender to the Lord. I wish someone would get that. You've got to learn to surrender yourself. The Bible says, if you surrender yourself under the mighty hand of God in due season, he will lift you up. Has anybody ever had to wait till the due season came? The songwriter said he may not come when you want him, but thank God he's always on time. Is there anybody in the house who can, who can really shout about the fact that God is always in on time? God, yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, and you want him to come right now, but thank God he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Can you stand on your feet for about 10 seconds and give him some praise if he's ever been an on-time God? Oh, is that all you got for him? You were sick in the hospital, but he became an on-time God. You were in an automobile accident, but he was an on-time God. You didn't have money to pay that bill, but he was an on-time God. That friend messed with you, 
stabbed you in the back, but he was an on-time God. You didn't have finances to handle this, but he was an on-time God. You were in a depressed stage, but he was an on-time God. You didn't have any more family yet left on your side, but he was an on-time God. Your health was deceptive. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Can you give him some praise right there? Okay, you go to your seat. He says, he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. He says, therefore, I beseech you, I urge you to walk worthy of the vocation, the calling that God has placed you in. And if you're walking, uh, if you're walking in the worthy of the vocation that God has called you in, next, next uh, piece there, that has called you in, has called you in, then you will surrender yourself to him. And if you surrender yourself to him, and I'm almost finished, you'll find out that there's certain fruits, fruits that happen when you surrender yourself to the Lord. When you surrender yourself to the Lord, I just told you I wanted to take the brother out, but because I was a prisoner of the Lord, because I was incarcerated, if you will, with with the Bible and with prayer, believing that God uh, had me held up to do the things that I wanted to do but would not do. There are certain kinds of fruit. Say there are certain kinds of fruit. When you're walking, he wants you to walk in the calling, in your calling as Christians. And what are the fruits? They are four things. They're first of all, lowliness. Say lowliness. In, in other words, lowliness means, you can write this down, to be humble in your purpose. Say to be humble in your purpose the purpose that God has called you God has called us to be humble the Bible says again when you humble yourself before the all before the almighty God he will then lift you up those who humble themselves will be what exalted but those who exhaust themselves shall be what brought low and so we've got to learn how to humble ourselves so therefore when you surrender yourself to God you have a humble spirit you don't walk around with your chest all out you don't walk around with your high, with your head so high nobody can reach up and talk to you you don't walk around exalted but rather you walk around humbly before the almighty God so that God then can exalt you you're wondering why you can never be exalted it's because you're already too high now and that the Bible says when you're too high, what God does is he has to bring us low. Maybe that's what's happening to this country. Maybe that's what's happened to, 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 to the nation. There was a time that we believed in the almighty God. There was a time that we pushed morality. But today we are pushing immorality and we've been led by immorality. And in the process, what God has to do is he has to sometimes take stuff away from us. And sometimes to take stuff away from us is a blessing from God. Because what that does is that draws us near God. Have I got a witness in the house? We start to pray like we never prayed before. Sometimes God... God has to humble us. Sometimes he gives us all this stuff away from us and the next thing you know he starts to it, slowly pulling stuff away from us. Why? Because God is trying to tell us something. You've got to humble yourself before the hands of the almighty God. In order to be humble God sometimes has to bring us low. Have I got a witness in the house? Say humble yourselves. And then he says, not only that, but the fruit of the Spirit is also meekness. Say meekness. Humbleness goes with meekness, and meekness is not weakness. That's an interesting word. The word is what we call a word picture in hermeneutics. That is a picture of a horse with a bit in its mouth. A big old horse with that bit and those reins that you guide the horse with. As long as the bit is in, watch this, as long as the bit is in the horse's mouth tied to the rein, the, the horse will submit itself to you. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I used to be afraid of horses, especially when I was asked to ride one. Well, I was dating Maryland back then, you know, and I wanted to show off. And one of my brothers said, let's go riding horses. So I wanted her to let, I wanted her to know, you know, that I'm a good horse rider. And so I went over there. I said, give me the biggest horse out here and get her a little pony. And I, I came up to the horse. And the horse was way up there. And, and, and I said to myself, I said, I don't know how I can back out of this thing. Because 
I know good and well that I'm not going to be able to control that horse. Big as he is, I'm sure that when he decides to go, he's going to go and let go. But, you know, I had Marilyn with me, and I had to let her know that I was sorrow for her. <laughs> and I could handle whatever color the horse was. And I was afraid of the horse, and I got on the horse, and I was scared and shaking, but because uh, she was in front of me, she never saw how my nerves were showing. <laughs> and, and I just knew that I could not control this big beast called a horse. But the trainer told me, all you have to do is, is make sure you tell the horse which way to go. Hit it to the side. It'll go fast. Hit it to the side a couple times. It'll go faster. Pull back on the reins, and the horse would stop. I, I didn't believe it, but I started doing it. But I learned something about riding horses, that the horse always submits itself to the bit on the inside of its mouth and the rein. What I'm trying to tell you, the reason why I do what I do and that some things I don't do what I really want to do is because there is a bit in the inside of my spirit. Have I got a witness? Have I got a witness in the house? There is the word of God and the Bible says that the word of God is a lamp and a light to guide your pathway. Have I got a witness in the house? The Bible says all you have to do is put the word on the inside of you. And the word will tell you which way to go. When you want to go left and you got the word of God on the inside of you, I wish I had a witness. It'll make you go right. When you want to slow down, it'll speed you up. When you want to stop with the bit inside of the horse, it, it, it'll make you stop when you want to stop. Have I got a witness in the house? I stopped by to tell you I want to be like the horse. I need to be meek. And to be meek means that you've got something controlling you on the inside. Instead of you being weak, you are actually a very strong. Strong. Have I got a witness? What is it about Christians? We can handle it when storms come our way. We can talk to God about it. When we don't know which way to go, we can tell Jesus all about it. When the doctors have given us up for a sickness that we can't handle, we can tell the doctor, I have another doctor who can handle my, my physical problem. When my mind is messed up, I don't have to take all these pills. God will be a mind regulator for me. Have I got a witness in the house? When you've got Jesus on your side, the old folk used to say, that's enough. Come on, stand on your feet. Yes, meekness is like having the bit of the horse, the bit inside of his mouth. We've got the Holy Spirit inside of us, the word of God. And so we can walk like Christians, talk like Christians, think like Christians. If there's ever an era, I believe that we're being challenged with regards to our Christianity, it's now. When we hear stuff that's being said out there, you don't have to get angry. You just keep acting like a Christian. Come on. And watch this. A Christian is not only lowly, meek, but a Christian is always long-suffering. That does not mean to suffer long. It means to have spiritual restraints. It means that you can hold up while up under certain kind of stuff. If you wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he will strengthen your heart. And then the song writer said, and the psalmist said, wait, I said, and again, I said, wait. The Bible says, they that wait on the Lord, he shall mount up with wings as eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and never faint. Watch this last fruit of surrender. He says, forbearing one another. And the word forbearing one another means keeping each other from falling flat on our backs. It means propping each other up. That's what Sunday morning is about. It's about walking up to somebody that you never said and say, hey, how you doing? They say, oh, I'm had a tough week. You start to propping them up saying the Lord will make a way out of no way. The Lord will be your friend. The Lord will handle it in due season. It's about propping 
each other up. And then he says, forbear one another in love. The badge of identity is really about how much we love each other. Not to just love people who are like us, but people who are not like us. That's what I love about Mount Zion. She just loves anybody and everybody. She accepts and embraces any and everybody. She'll go down to the city mission once or twice a month and she'll see folk who are down and out, not clean, not calmly, as they used to say, and they'll feed them a meal and then talk to them and tell them how much Jesus loves them. As you bow your heads in a word of thanks unto God, just remember, Jesus loved us first and he gave to us his best. Just thank God. And ask God that you bear these particular fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is lowliness, humble in purpose, meekness, having another source on the inside of you, long suffering, having spiritual restraints against sin, forbearing each other. Paul says, walk in this kind of a life. And in due season, God will exalt you. Oh God, even now, we thank you for this moment and this time to which you have shared with us. Thank you, God, for even giving me my own story about how I wanted to retaliate. But somehow, even now, as I see my brother, I say to him, good to see you, my friend. It's all because I had to humble myself. I had to be stronger than what was on the outside. I had to be patient and wait on you. And I had to even be patient. And I tried to prop that brother up. Thank you, God, for the new relationship that you have given me. And even this morning, God, there were testimonies of folk who are dealing with folk who are mistreating them. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you will give that person and those persons all the resources to wait and remain Christian and watch you work it out in due season. Thank you, God, for the Apostle Paul who writes to us by way of the Church of Ephesus, sharing with us what our conduct must always be. In Jesus' name we pray, and all the people of God shouted, amen. Give God a great big hand praise in the house. Amen. Give your neighbor a great